to Jude, right before Revelation. Jude, we'll look at verses 1 through 5. It always feels funny when you're telling someone to turn to a book that has one chapter in it. So do you say Jude chapter 1, verses 1 through 5? Because it's just Jude 1 through 5. You can just say it like that. But you'll get it when you get there. So Jude chapter 1. Pick it up in verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Behold, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints." For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you to remembrance, uh, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believeth not. Brother Rod, will you ask the Lord to bless the evening? Amen. If you'll look back with me at verse 3 where it says, uh, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. And that's something I want to preach about here tonight is contending for the faith. To contend means to strive and contest, a rivalry against difficulties. It means to fight. It means to fight. And if you've been saved very long and uh, you've been living the Christian life, and you've been living for the Lord, you've discovered on your own that it's a fight to do right. It's a fight to do right. Uh, have you not found that in your Christian life? You know, people say, well, the Christian life ain't, it ain't nothing to it. It's, a, it's a easy to walk with the Lord. You're wrong. You're not walking with the Lord if, if there seems to be troubles at every, every corner, every pass. But you know what? I'd rather walk in trouble with the Lord than walk in trouble with the world. Uh, it's a fight to do right. Have you not found that out in your own Christian life? And not only does it say to contend for the faith, but look how it says to contend. It says to earnestly contend. That's with sincere and intense conviction. That means to mean business. Uh, you're going to have to fight for your marriage. If you've been married very long, you understand uh, it, it's a fight. It's a fight to stay together. It's a fight to get along. Uh, that's one thing you... You learn after a person gets married, you know, that you realize you've, I've just been married. I, it's another person. <laughs> and this person is now living under my roof. And this person has their own opinions and ideas and personality. You know, isn't it a strange thing? You know, you think you marry someone and everything's going to be great. And you move in with each other and realize, that's a person. How dare they come in here with their own ideas and opinions? <laughs> you know, and it's a fight. A marriage, a, a good marriage is even a fight. Uh, you got to contend. You got to fight for a Christian marriage. You got to fight to have a Christian home. You got to put in effort. Uh, it, and you got to uh, earnestly do that. Uh, now, something I want to just ask you is the faith you have in Christ, is it worth fighting for? Is it worth contending for? Is it worth putting in that effort? Uh, you know, oftentimes I remember seeing uh, situations where I didn't want to, you know, you don't want to get into and you just kind of want to hands off and you just, uh, I was at a gas station one time. I've told you all about this before. It's my corn dog story. I got one corn dog story. And I stopped at the Yellow Hammer as exit 69 on the way uh, coming back home and uh, right, off the, right off the interstate. It's the Yellow Hammer. And I stopped in there to get gas and they got corn dogs in there. And I like corn dogs. Since, ever since high school, you know, you get those. Corn dogs, <coughs> ketchup and some mustard and just dip them in there. Man, I love it. 
So I went in there, got me two corn dogs and, and got me a, a, a Yoo-Hoo or something. I can't remember. Something real healthy, you know. And uh, I got out there to the truck, had my corn dogs and my Yoo-Hoo, and I just stepped into the truck, and I see a man just cussing and hollering at a lady. She's just sitting behind the steering wheel just over right beside me, and I'm like, none of my business. None of my business. going to mind my own business. I'm going to go home. I'm going to eat my corn dog. And so I just sitting in my truck, and I'm just listening, and he's just, and I feel like it's about to get physical, so I just sit there for a second. So I'm like, my mama will whoop me if I leave right now. <laughs> so I just sat there for a second, and he took off and got in his truck and woo, spun out of there and left. And that lady, she's just sitting there, she's just crying with her hands. And I had some gospel tracks there. And I walked over to her, I still had my corn dog in my hand. And I said, ma'am, can I get, you know, I'm standing there with a corn dog in my hand. <laughs> ma'am, can I give you something to read when you get a chance? I, I said, I understand you're going through something that's real hard right now. And as I'm talking to her, here he comes back again. He spun right, and he comes and he blocks. He's right behind my truck. I can't back out now. And he sees somebody talking to his woman. I'm like, oh my goodness. So I'm standing there with, standing there with corn dog. I'm not a fighter. I'm, I'm really not. <laughs> I'm really not. I, I avoid a fight if I can, can handle it. You know, if I, if, I can, if I can get away. But I was pinned in right there, and he'd come up. He said, what you black and black black doing? And I didn't know why I said it, but I pointed that corn dog right at him. I said, hey, you ain't a man. <laughs> you ain't done nothing until you pointed a corn dog at somebody to defend yourself. <laughs> you, you ain't nothing to you. I said, a real man wouldn't talk to a woman like that. I said, you're not. That's all I said to him. You're not a man. He just looking at me, you know, pointing that corn dog. And I guess the Lord said, told him to get in that truck and get out of there. You know, the Lord protected me. I got that corn dog. <laughs> Maybe he's scared it was, it, was going to, it was hot or something. It was going to get poked. I said all that. I don't know why I said all that. But you know what? You got to contend and be willing to fight for the faith. Uh, some things are worth fighting for. You know, most people, they'll back down. They'll say, well, it's not worth this. I'll just mind my own business. I'll just get out. Uh, sometimes it's the Lord's business that you're not minding. you got to choose your battles. But if it's for the Lord, you ought to do something. Sometimes you ought to speak up when it's inconvenient. There's never going to be a real convenient time for you to speak up for the Lord. Oftentimes it's always going to be inconvenient. Uh, you know, the life, the Christian life, as I said, it's, it's not just contending with the devil. You're not just contending with the world, and the world is, is wicked and evil, but you're contending with yourself often. You're contending with your, uh, with your own flesh. You know, I wake up in the morning, and I go into the bathroom, look in the mirror, and I'm like, what are you up to today, <laughs> you jerk? That's the guy i got to talk down. He says, uh, you need to watch yourself, buddy. I'm watching you. You're no good. You know what? You've got to contend with yourself. Put your flesh down. Says, no, you can't think that way. No, you can't feel this way. No, you can't do that. No, you're wrong. You know, you've got to tell yourself sometimes you're wrong. Look yourself right and dead in the eye. In the mirror. No, God, no, no, you're wrong. And you need to fix it. Uh, that's contending for the faith. So tonight I just want to look at a few things. If you'll turn with me, we'll primarily be over in a different passage. Over in 1 Samuel chapter 17. It's one of the most... Um, probably preached events, I think, that's out there. Most of you know this text a lot better than I do if you've been saved very long. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, the events in David's life that's uh, leading up to him uh, contending with the, with the champion of the Philistines, uh, Goliath. And I just want to look at a few things there in, in David's life where he's contending for the faith. He's got to fight for it. He's got to fight. I think it's worth fighting for. Uh, I think it's worth it. 1 Samuel chapter 17, pick it up in uh, verse 20. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the uh, trench as the host was going forth to fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army, and David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage, and he ran into the army. He came and saluted his brethren, and as he talked with them, behold, there came up of the champions the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, 
out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him, and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be that the man that killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will uh, give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake unto the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done unto this man that killeth the Philistine, and take away the reproach from Israel? And who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered after this matter, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And uh, Elab, the eldest brother, heard that he spake unto the men, and Elab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and thy naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou might see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward the nether, and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with the Philistine. Now tonight I just want to look at a few things here in the text about contending for the face, faith <coughs> and the first thing I want to look at is if you're going to contend in your Christian life, in the Christian faith, uh, you're going to need a sincere plan. You're going to need to be real with God. Uh, you need some sincerity with your prayer life, some sincerity with your conversation, some sincerity in uh, uh, your plan, your drive to do something for the Lord. You're going to have to mean business. Uh, it's not the Christian life isn't something you can live passively. It's not something you can live on Sunday. You're not going to be a contender in the faith for Jesus Christ if you're a Sunday Christian. You ought to just be a Christian, not just a Sunday Christian or a Wednesday night Christian. And that's where the majority of uh, God's people are, I think, right now, is uh, Christianity is something that you do at a certain place and time. It's something that you practice uh, it's more social than it is spiritual. Do, am, are you understanding what I'm saying? Are you seeing that with other people who, um, you know, and I don't mean to pick on others. We're, we're, we're even more so in that boat, I think, as Bible believers. We're even more so in that boat because we hide behind the giant King James Bible. Say, well, look what we got right. But just because you got that right, there's much more to the Christian life than just holding a King James Bible under your arm and knowing it's the truth. There's a lot more to that Christian life. You're going to have to fight. Uh, if you're going to contend for the faith, you're going to have to have a sincere plan. You know, I think it's funny. I heard a preacher say one time, if you want to hear God laugh, just tell him your plans. You know, but the Bible says, uh, where there is no vision, the people perish. A Christian, you want to have a vision and a plan laid out in your life that is in line with God, what God wants you to do. What God wants you to do. I was telling the kids this morning in junior church, there's something the Lord calls you to His harvest. There's something in the harvest that only you can do that I can't do as a preacher. To those individual uh, kids and to them, that's lights going off in them like I can do something for the Lord. It's not just a preacher's ministry. Uh, the ministry that the Lord, the, the majority of the ministries has nothing to do with evangelism or being a preacher or a pastor at all or a connection with a church at all. Uh, the Christian life primarily has nothing to do with those things. It's just living day by day. The Christian life is living day by day. If you're going to contend for the faith, you're going to need a sincere plan. Uh, now, one thing you need to take note of, if, if you uh, aim for nothing, you'll hit your mark every time. You ought to have an aim in your Christian life, because if you aim for nothing, you'll always hit that mark. The first thing I want to look at here is, in your sincere plan, is you ought to talk right. You know, that sounds like a funny thing. Like I hear someone, people say, well, how does a person become successful? They had a very successful man speaking at a graduation, and he said, well, if you want to be successful, the first thing you ought to do is make your bed in the morning. People thought, just laugh, that's, that's just a foolish thing. He says, no, that's something that's uh, 
It's, a, it's for self. It's for you. It's for something that you ought to bring attention to yourself to start your day, to start a routine. Um, firstly, you ought to talk right. Uh, look over at where we're here, 1 Samuel chapter 17. Look at verse 28. And Elab, his oldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Elab's anger was kindled against David, so he's already angry. And he said, Why camest thou down hither, and with whom hast thou left those few sheep with in the wilderness? He's degrading his little brother. He's angry with him. What you doing here? You're just coming to see the fight. Who'd you leave those few sheep with? You ever have somebody just degrade you? Nobody wants to be dismissed. You know, sometimes you get that at work. Sometimes you get that at home. Sometimes you get that in the grocery store where somebody just, dis, just kind of dismisses you as a anything <clears throat> and just kind of speaks degrading of you, kind of talks down to you. Oh, you're just, where did you leave? Look, all you are is a little shepherd boy. You have no business being here. I don't want you here. And the things that you do in life are pretty useless. And that's a pretty degrading thing to do, to degrade someone like that, the things that they do for a living. That's like degrading a, 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 a woman like my wife, like she raises our kid. I don't think that's a, a little thing at all. Well, you're nothing but a homemaker. It's hard to make a home. Well, you're nothing but a housewife. It's hard to be a housewife. So, well, it's... You know, there's nothing to, to homeschooling. It's a lot to homeschooling. You ought not dismiss someone like that. You know, you ought to think about the words that come out of your mouth. You know, one thing about contending for the faith, you don't think much of it, but that tongue is a deadly sword. And you've got to be careful how you talk to people. I know after I got saved, I was all gung-ho out of Bible school, and I remember people at church bringing up foolish things. I thought, I thought in prayer meeting and I just dismissed it. I'm like, oh, just get over that. That's silly. Just tell him to hush, you know, tell her to be quiet, tell him to, to take a hike, you know, and I'm just dismissing it, you know. But people really have problems. And you just can't dismiss someone's problem. Consider your tongue. Psalms 19, verse 14, David said, let the words of my mouth be acceptable in thy sight. You know what? That's a strange thing to pray. Lord, let the words of my mouth be acceptable in thy sight. You know, have you ever said some unacceptable words? They're unacceptable to God. Have you ever prayed that? Lord, let my words be acceptable. Let me say those things that are right. You know, I've heard people say that a lot of times. They say, well, they can't control me. You know, I'm just, I'm just saying what I'm saying. I'm just saying the truth. If they can't handle it, that's too bad. You're a fool. That's a selfish, foolish thing to say. I don't care what they, I'm just going to tell them the truth. Well, hold up a second. Are you really giving them the truth or are you giving them your arrogance with a bad attitude? Is that a Christ-like spirit you have? Or is that a flesh-like spirit you have? If you're going to contend for the faith, you need to have a sincere plan. Your plan ought to be, I'm going to talk right. I'm going to say those things that please my Lord. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good for the use of edifying. Why? That it may minister. You hear what I'm saying? that it may minister grace unto the hearers. You're going to fight. You better learn to use that tongue correctly. That's your weapon. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You're trying to bring someone into the faith. Well, how about that tongue? I've heard a preacher say one time, you've got to watch that tongue, that a woman, now he said this back in the, probably the 70s, and hold on, and don't, don't throw anything at me yet till I get done saying it. Says, woman, a woman these days, uh, the modern woman these days can get more dirt out of a telephone than she can a vacuum cleaner. But the men can too. 2023, and you see just as many men doing this, getting that dirt, sucking that dirt up like a vacuum. Got the vacuum running, just sucking up dirt. 
Rick and David's are happy because they don't have a phone that can even has the internet on it. I'll hit you in a minute. You just wait. <laughs> yeah, you got to decide you're going to talk right. Not only are you going to talk right, but you're going to do right. Uh, that's something that you decide ahead of time. I was talking to the kids in the youth group. I said, doing right is something you decided yesterday. Because what's going to happen is you're going to, uh, sin doesn't say, say you're getting closer. Beep, beep, beep. It's not like a beeper, you know, where you're getting close to something wicked. Beep, 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 beep. And there it is. That's not how sin works. Sin slaps you right in the face. Here I am. I'm right here. That's how sin is. And you've got to deal with it now that it's right here. But that's something that you had to deal with yesterday. That you should have dealt with yesterday. Uh, the young man in here, you needed to decide today what you're gonna, how you're going to face sin tomorrow. You ought to say, Lord, uh, wash me, cleanse me, help me stay clean. And Lord, help my eyes look upon right things. Uh, you better prepare for that today. Why? Because those things are going to show up and you're going to have to deal with them on the spot. You know what your flesh likes to do on the spot? Whatever it wants to. Whatever it wants to. Uh, the old preacher used to say a, a, a man or even a woman, they ought to be able to do three things at the drop of a hat. At the drop of a hat, everybody in this room that is saved, you ought to be able to preach, pray, or die at any moment. Are you ready to preach? Uh, I know a woman can give a, a good, clear sermon to another lady or some, some folks says, hey, if y'all don't get saved, y'all going to go to hell. You know what? A, a lady's the one that got me saved. She gave me the gospel. Do you know what? Uh, just, just like the men, you women, you ought to be ready to preach. You ought to be ready to pray. You ought to be ready to die at the drop of a hat. Are you ready? Are you ready? Look over at chapter 17 here. Look at verse 11. It says, and when Saul and all of Israel heard the words of this Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. You notice David wasn't afraid when he heard it. When they heard these words, they were fearful. They were full of fear. Why didn't they make preparations so when they heard those words, they were ready to respond? You know, you think of the firefighters. I remember as a <coughs> young kid in school, they took us to the fire department in Alexander City, and we got to look at the fire trucks and, and see the hoses and everything, and I thought it was a neat thing. All the firemen's gear, uh, the boots were already in the pants, and they had everything ready, and all the guy had to do was step one foot, step one foot in, whoop, and he was all ready. They didn't have it folded up in, in closets or in drawers anywhere where they go, oh, there's a fire? Oh, where did I put my boots? Oh, let me find this. Is it, oh, they're in the washer. Well, let's wait. They'll be dry here in a little bit. No, they, they were ready. They made preparations the day before. Uh, so if there was a fire, they were ready to go. Are you ready to go? Are you ready to go? If the Lord calls out tonight, well, hold on, I'm not ready. I wasn't thinking it was really going to happen. I didn't think it was going to be right now. I didn't think things were going to. Are you ready to see the Lord? What's holding you back? Well, you know, I've got to work. <laughs> I wouldn't expect this. I've got a doctor's appointment tomorrow. <laughs> My dog is getting groomed. I can't. <laughs> you be ready to do right in the moment. You ought to be ready. You know what? You could spot a Christian who has no spiritual vision or plan in their life by their conversation under pressure. I'm talking about when trouble comes immediately, when that tire blows out and you're on the side of the road and you're late for work. You can tell a lot about a person when the rubber it's the, when things really happen. You understand? Tell a lot about somebody. Uh, you need to have a sincere plan to talk right, to do right. And then lastly on that point, to stay right. You need to have a plan that you're going to stay right. Look at chapter 17. Look at verse 32. 17, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. You know what? Everybody would have been just fine with David getting back on that chariot and going back to his few sheep. 
they would have been fine with that. Nobody would have missed him. Nobody would have said, oh, there he is, you know, oh, look at David, look at him running from the battle. He's a coward. Nobody would have thought that. They would have thought, he's just a shepherd boy. We're the men of the battle. Just let him go. Uh, you need to make a sincere plan that you're going to talk right, do right, and that you're going to stay right. David says, despite what they're saying to me, despite being ragged down by my older brother, I'm going to stick this thing out. Because why? I made plans for this yesterday. If you're going to contend for the faith, you're going to need a sincere plan. Secondly, if you're going to contend for the faith, you're going to need a solitary preparation. It's just you and God. Just you and God. You know, I found some of the most uh, important and biggest points in my Christian life was a point where it was just me and the Lord, me by myself, and it's just me and Him. Me and Him in prayer, and it's just maybe me and Him in the house. When I think of the highlights of my Christian life, you know, I can tell you some neat things about people getting saved in the jails and, and going out and doing some neat things in the Christian life, but the big, the big things in my Christian life were just me and Him in my bedroom. Me and Him in prayer. You know what I believe David had that preparation, that solitary preparation, that's how he was able to contend because he made preparation. Look with me, look over at 1 Samuel 16. Let's look a chapter back. Chapter 16, look at verse 1. And the Lord said unto Samuel, and this is the calling right here, verse 16, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I, will, I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint uh, unto me him whom I uh, name unto thee. And Samuel did that which uh, the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse his sons, and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass, when they were come, that he took Elam, and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but, God, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Amen. Look over at verse 11, and Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. Jesse said, Yeah, there's, there's one more. He had all the boys pass before him. And he says, This ain't him. God said, That ain't him. Where was the one the Lord was interested in? He was by himself taking care of his father's business. You hear what I'm saying? He was alone out in the wilderness with his father's sheep doing what the Lord wanted him to do. A solitary preparation has great purpose to it, and it's very needful in the Christian life. It's needful to purify your heart of all infractions. Um, look at Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30, look at verse 12. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes, and yet are not washed from their filthiness. They are pure in their own eyes, but they're not washed. You know what, I, I feel like that's a lot of times, <coughs> excuse me, that's a lot of times, that's, 
That's us. We're right. We got the book. We got the church. We're at, we're at church on a Sunday night. You look at the population of Christians in this town, I wonder how many are in church on a Sunday night. Very few. But we got to be careful of that because oftentimes we weigh that out. Well, look at, look at all the Christian life that I'm doing. But that doesn't mean it's the Christian you're being. It's good to have that solitary preparation. Why? It purifies uh, the heart from all infraction. You know the, where it says there, there is a generation. I think that's our generation. That's us. We're not washed from our own filthiness. You know what? It's, it's good for you to get along with God and just you and Him. I know I love being back here with the men while they pray, and I love praying with my boys and with my wife. And, uh, but my best prayer time is just me and Him. It's just me and him. Me and him in the morning, me and him at lunch, me and him at night. A lot of times I pray with me and him in the shower. I'm just praying, talking to him. David said in Psalms 139, verse 23, speaking to the Lord, he said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. That's a strange thing to pray. Lord, search me and know me. Why? Because he wants it revealed to him, his problems. Lord, uh, search me out. Lord, if there's something wrong with me, I want it fixed. I want it right. I want to be right. I want to be clean. I want to be right with him. You know, you go to the doctor at a doctor's visit. You know, you're expecting the doctor to tell you what is wrong. You might have an idea. You might think you know what's wrong. But you go in and he says, uh, well, is it this? No, the doctor says, this, this is your root problem. This is what's causing all those other things. And this is what you got to do to fix it. But you know what? You got to make an appointment and say, hey, can I see, uh, can I see the doctor at you know, Tuesday at 3 o'clock? Yeah, come in at 3 o'clock and I'll see you. And you got to go up there and you got to sit down and you got to let someone else examine you. You understand what I'm saying? You need to make an appointment with the Lord where you sit down, Lord, it's just going to be me and you for a little bit. Will you check me out? And Lord, bring to my attention those things that are wrong that you won't fix. Oftentimes, we just think we already know what's wrong in our lives and we tend to fix them ourselves and we don't ask the Lord that. Well, I know what's wrong with me. If I could just, if I could just work on my mouth, if I could just work on my attitude, you know, just work on my thoughts. And the Lord says, well, I'm interested in this. Well, if I could just work, no, I'm interested in your marriage. Well, I want to work on my thoughts. Well, I'm interested in your marriage. Well, I want to work on the kids. No, I'm interested in your marriage. You know, the Lord would do that. But we go to the Lord and says, no, I want to fix this. The Lord says, I'm interested in that. I hope I'm saying some real stuff to you here tonight. To purify the heart of it, all infraction. That's why you should have a solitary preparation. And also to build character through your actions. Look over at chapter 17. Back in our text, chapter 17, look at um, verses 34. And David spake unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of the mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord hath that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto him, David, go, and the Lord be with thee. Uh, you know, it's a funny thing to me. You know, David faced off with the lion and the bear, and no one was watching when he responded. You know what he could have done? He could have came back to the house and said, they were taken by a bear. I couldn't do nothing about it. They were taken by a lion. There was nothing I could do. You know what David did? He spent time with those sheep. He was a good shepherd. He knew them by name. He talked to them. He slept where they slept. 
and they trusted him and he cared for them. Why? Those were his father's sheep. No, his brother said to him, those few sheep, those few sheep were God's sheep. Those were special to him. Do you know what was going on there is uh, he was building a great character within himself. You know, man knows you for your reputation and God knows you for your character. Reputation is what man thinks you to be. Character is what God knows you to be. Now, I, I know you as I see you, but God knows you as you are. I want to read a poem I have right here. Who in here has heard the poem, Footprints in the Sand? You've heard that? All right, this is similar to that. <clears throat> One night I had a wondrous dream. One set of footprints there was seen. The footprints of my precious Lord, but mine were not along the shore. But when some stranger prince appeared, and they asked the Lord, what have we here? Those prints are large and round and neat, but Lord, they are too big for feet. My child, he said in somber tones, for miles I carried you alone. I challenged you to walk in faith, but you refused and made me wait. You disobeyed, you would not grow. The walk of faith, you would not know. So I got tired, I got fed up, and there I dropped you on your butt. Because in life there comes a time where one must fight and one must climb, when one must rise and take a stand or leave their butt prints in the sand. You know what it is? It's taking some action in your Christian life. Doing something. So solitary preparation is to purify the heart of all infraction, is to build character through your actions, is to establish communication without distraction. This world is full of distractions. Man, that phone, I tell you what, it's, it's right here. Man, I got the news, I got the weather, I got Pinterest, I got a calculator, I got my pictures I've taken, I got YouTube, I got a compass, I got the, no, I don't have that no more. I had the Disney Channel, but I don't, I don't watch that mess no more. It's wicked. Uh, got the Apple Store, got Apple TV, I got Farmer's Bank, I got Pluto TV, I got my Kindle on there, I got fitness. Yeah, right, like I use that, fitness. <laughs> got a clock, I got, all, I got the weather bug, got the maps on there, got books on there, sermon audio on there, got music, I got health, I got Google Earth. Some of y'all got a lot more apps than that on there. You know what is that? That's a time sucker. That's what it is. You need a solitary preparation what, to establish communication without being distracted. You know what? It needs to be just you and God sometimes. Just you and Him. You know what? The TV will have something on. Well, after this show, I'm going to watch one more show and I'm going to go sit down and read for a little bit. Then, then the, the next season. <laughs> We're going to look at, you know, it's just some neat thing. Well, obviously, i got to watch that next episode, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, and you're sitting there watching three hours of TV before you know it, and like, oh, I can't read for five minutes. i got to get in bed. I can't pray right now. now. I'm talking about, this is me right now. I know, I know how I am. To establish communication without distraction. You need a solitary preparation. You need to find a prayer closet, you need to find a room in your house, you need to find a corner somewhere. If it's your car, if you got to get out of your house to stop hearing the TV on or somebody's running the radio or got the TV on or somebody's fussing or somebody's always talking and you need to just go sit in your parking lot, crank it up, let the gas run a little bit, just sit there and just read your Bible and have a quiet time. You need that. You've got to have that. Just between you and the Lord, just you reading and you praying and talking to Him, you need to be undistracted. Say, so, well, I'm a multitasker. I've, that, that, I, I, that, I hate that term. It's so stupid. I'm a multitasker. No, what you're saying is, I'm going to give myself cheaply to five different things. That's what that means. I mean, I can kind of get those, th I can kind of get those things done. I'm a multitasker. No, you're going to do it very cheaply. I don't want somebody says, oh, uh, I'm a multitasker. 
multitasker. No, I'm going to do your heart, open heart surgery, but I'm also a multitasker, so I'm doing a brain surgery right as I'm doing that. Like, no, I don't want you. I want you focused on me. <laughs> Especially when I see the bill, I want to think, man, he should have focused on me, much as I paid him. David said in Psalm 63, 6, When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, just laying in bed and thinking on him, the greatness of God. I was laying in Levi's bed with him in the bunk bed one night. We are just talking about, he said, Dad, is God big enough to pick up this house? I said, I said yes, son. He, he could pick up the whole state of Missouri, and the, he holds the, the whole world in his hands. He says, that's pretty big, Dad. <laughs> that's pretty big. And we just laid there and thought about how big God was. And it was a pretty neat thing. Psalms 4.4 4 says, Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. You know, sometimes you just need to be still. The dishes, leave them alone. The laundry, leave it alone. The magazine, the remote control, the dog, the car, the bills, Leave them alone for a little bit. Go sit down and read and pray. You say, that sounds like such a simple thing. I'm saying some of you won't allow yourself to do that. Some of you ladies especially. If you're going to contend for the faith, you're going to need to, need to have a sincere plan, a solitary preparation, and lastly, a selfless purpose. A selfless purpose. Look at verse 29, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 29. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? David says, is there not a cause for someone to be here, for me to be here and to hear this? Is there not purpose for someone to stand against this? Is there not a cause? You know, if a man lives only for himself, uh, he'll eventually run out of reasons to live. That's true. If you live only for self, eventually you'll run out of reasons to live. The greatest accomplishment in life is to find out what God wants you to do and do it. That's what the old preacher told me. I wrote it down in my Bible. He says the greatest accomplishment you can ever do is to find out what God wants you to do and to do it. You know, I heard a young Christian with a lot of zeal one time say, you know, I'm willing to die for the cause of Christ. You know, it's very unlikely. It's very unlikely. Now, he might. The Lord, the Lord might give you an opportunity to die for him, but very likely the Lord wants you to just live for him. You know, dying is easy. Staying alive to do right is the hard part. You need a selfless, pur a selfless purpose in your life. You know what? David was a great contender for the faith. In his life and the things that you've seen that he'd done, he is a great example. One of the greatest examples, but not the greatest example. The greatest example, look over in Psalms. Turn with me. We'll be done here in just a little bit. Psalms 22. And this is a very familiar passage, and we know who we're looking at here, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why, why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and I am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, a despise of the people. All that see me laugh at me to scorn, and they shoot out the lip. They shake their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. Who are they talking about? That's Christ. Verse 9, But thou... Uh, but thou art he that took me out of the womb, and thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast out, I was cast upon thee from the uh, womb, and thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is no help, none to help. 
Verse 12, many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. They gaped upon me with their mouth, says, raveling and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, all my bones are out of joint, my heart is like wax, it is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shard, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hand in my feet. We know who that is. I may tell my bones, they look and stare at me. What is that tale? What does that mean? You go to the bank and you go to a teller. What does a teller do? A teller counts. You could count the Lord's bones. They beat him so hard. Verse 18, they Part my garments among them, they cast lots for my vesture. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength, strength hast thee to uh, help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, darling from the power of the dog. Now take your Bible. Now that's a neat thing over in verse 12 where it talks about these bulls of Bashan. You know, we look at the, uh, well, we'll go ahead and turn over with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 50. Now we generally when we talk about the crucifixion we look at the physical aspect of it with the soldiers and the people who were physically there in the physical torment which they put upon their Savior upon the cross. And we see the, the slashes and we see the, the crown of thorns and we see the spear going to his side and we see the blood and the rain and all the things that were going on physically that day. But in our text there in Psalms it says the bulls of Bashan were there, were, were around about him. There were some spiritual things, there were spiritual giants, there were spiritual devils around him. Do you know what they were saying to him? Come down off that cross. The devil gave everything that he had in his bag and threw it at Jesus Christ. You know, there's the Honeybee Quartet, which was Lester Olaf's group of girls, uh, had girl singers. They called them the Honeybee Quartet. If, uh, you ought to look it up on, on that YouTube. <laughs> I'm sitting here preaching against the phone, then I'm recommending you look something up. Well, I'm a hypocrite. Act like you never seen, you act like you never seen one, Rick. <laughs> But you ought to look up the Honeybee Quartet and they sing a song, He didn't come down, oh no, he didn't come down. But take your Bible, look at Isaiah chapter 50. Look at verse 5. The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away my back. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? You know, that's an amazing thing. That's what the Lord, He says to His Father, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? And the Father turns His back on the Son, and there's the devil, brings in all those mighty bulls and unleashes them on Jesus Christ. And as the Jesus Christ looks from His Father, He looks on all those devils, and He calls out like a gladiator in the Colosseum. He says, Who shall contend with me? And He calls to the devil, says, Bring me everything you've got. And He took it. What was he? He was a contender. He was a contender. Who will contend? Let him come near. What did the Lord do? Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. If you're going to contend for the faith in your Christian life, if you're going to put up a good fight, you're going to need three things. You're going to need a sincere plan. You're going to need to be real with God. You're going to need a solitary preparation. You're going to have to get alone with God. And you're going to need a selfless, a selfless purpose where it's only you and God. And mainly God. You understand? All right, we'll close right there. And I'll pray and we'll call it a night. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for your scriptures, that we know it to be true. We can hold it in our hands. 
I pray, Lord, that you would uh, guide us in the fight, that we'd be willing to put up a fight, Lord. There's, these things are worth fighting for, Lord. And, Lord, we want to put up a good fight till you come and call us home. Lord, so you can tell us, Lord, you have my good, faithful servant. You fought a good fight. Lord, I want to hear that from you. Lord, I want you to say, Barney, you fought good. Lord, and these believers here with me tonight, they want to hear you call their name and say, you fought good. You fought good. Lord, I pray that you would guide us in the fight and help us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.